Oh, hey, Mickey. Hey, Rob, how are you? I'm fine, how are you? Fine, you're on strike, I hear. Yes, well, yeah, I mean, that, the, being on strike and not working, to me, or I mean, that's then I'm always on strike, in a way. Um, well, yeah, we're on strike. Here's well, the strike sign, by the way. I should just, I can hold it up. Hold on, I'm holding it up. This is it, Writers Guild of America. It's bright, red, bright, this is the simple, generic strike sign. I, I should have it behind my head as a, as a convenient backdrop. Are you, are you, are, have you been picketing? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. What? Have you been picketing? I'm, you know, I can't hear you. I mean, I can hear you. I'm just not answering. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm going to actually take this, I was going to say, I could take this little poster, this little strike sign, I'm going to frame it and hang it in my house. It will be the most expensive piece of art I own. Why expensive? Because it's, this strike is costing me a lot of money. Well, it's weird. I hear two things about you, Rob, when I travel around Hollywood. One is... <laughs> wow. The, you, you travel around Hollywood, Mickey? I do. Oh, okay. I was I, in I Hollywood. I, buy it. I was in Hollywood just last night, the really? actual town of Hollywood. Oh. But um, I hear Rob Long, you know, he, you know he, he's a Republican, but he's nice. I mean, you know, he's conservative. He's, he's, Only half of that is true. He's not mean. Yeah. Uh, and the second thing is... Why doesn't he get with the program, you know? I mean, the, 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 the writer's strike is right, and you're like a, a dissenter yeah. from the union, and you're a scab. And they don't well, say I'm not a scab. They don't say you're a scab, but no, they, no, say, they say you should, you know, the writers are right, they should get some money, and, and right. why doesn't Rob, you know, come along with us? Who says that? Somebody last night, I forget who. I need names, Mickey. I'll give you the name afterwards. Um... Uh, I'm a dis- I'm a dissident from the union. I mean, I, I dissent from it, but I you know I've been an 18 year member. I've kicked in a lot of money to it. Um, it's like a, I think it's like a crazy relative who comes at the, uh, on the exactly the wrong time and wants to stay in your house. Oh, oh. You put up with it, um, but I don't. I mean, I, I'm not. A, I'm not against the idea of of even going out on strike, and I'm not even against the idea of having demands. I just think these demands are sort of misguided, misthought out. They're not strategic. They're not. And- they don't. They don't. They don't have any. Uh, so they, they're not appropriate to what it is that we do, and they don't do the thing they, they should be doing, yeah. which is to increase the number of opportunities for writers. So we increase the number of members of the Writers Guild, and two, to protect those writers whose careers are not stellar, right? right. To allow people who maybe only sell one project every two or three or four years to still be able to live in LA County, which is, you know, hard to do. Well, here. Uh, I mean, he, I, I haven't read your blog because every time I go to it, something horrible happens to my computer, like I get a virus or it crashes. So, how do you get a virus from my blog? It's a very simple blog. And I went to it has Flash or something. It has some. It does it's, not. It's fancy. It has, it has Twitter. It has all sorts of fancy things. It has Twitter. You 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 just gone crazy. You've got you've <laughs> built in a bunch of complicated. It's new media, man. <laughs> Come on, Grandpa. You don't have Twitter. <laughs> What's your problem? <laughs> anyway. Um, here, here's my basic question. I mean, you, you go to the movies, you read movie reviews, everybody says the writer is all important. If the right. movie has a terrible script, it's not going to work. So you figure, how could the writers fail to capitalize on their importance in, to the movie? I mean, a, a movie can survive a bad director, it can't survive a bad script. No, that's wrong. That's wrong? No, look, I love writers. I'm a writer. I mean, I will defend writers and write. I mean, but movies, TV, these things are, you know, you can have a huge hit TV show that, that's got, that, that stinks. The writing stinks. You can have a fantastic pick. I mean, a good director, I mean, a really good director can make a bad script a lot better. Huh. Uh, that's just the way it is. I mean, it's a visual but, medium. It's like, a, it's all these things together. I mean, you can't have an idea without a writer first. But, um, and I don't, I'm not diminishing the, 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 what the writers contribute. It's really important. I mean, I'm a writer. But I, I think we need to sort of, but, Get off our high horses. But if there were no union, writers would still be highly paid. So how could they screw that up? What? Well, right, because the, the point is the bulk of a working writer's pay pack is not union-related. I mean, it's, I mean, put it this way. The, the, the work that I do in television, I mean, I get a vast sum to write to do an episode or to, write a, a, to, to produce an episode or to write a pilot. Or, you know, they used to pay me a lot of money just to sit on my butt at a studio and think of ideas. Okay, so that that's that had nothing to do with the guilt. Yeah. I should uh, probably identify you for our audience before we go further. Why would you bother? Apparently, you, as you travel in your uh, circles in Hollywood, I'm I'm the subject of much conversation. Well, but that's how, well known. it's mostly how nice you are. Um, you're you're a screenwriter. I am. You wrote for Cheers. I did. You uh, you now do write for National Review and do commentary on NPR, and you're author of two books. One book called Conversations with My Agent. 
I lent to a bartender, and it was so good she never gave it back to me. Wow. And now you can't get it. And the second well, you book, you can, you can. The second book is called Set Up Joke, Set Up Joke. Are you holding these up? I'm holding this up. Good. Um, and it says here, it's the funniest and wisest thing to come out of Tinseltown since Curb Your Enthusiasm. Yeah. And I know you're a fan of Curb Your Enthusiasm, Rob. Uh, I, I, you know what? I'll tell you. I thought it had a uh, great first season, <laughs> and then I thought it dipped. But I have to be, and I, I remember last time we talked about it, I was fulminating about how terrible it was. Yes. This last season was fantastic. You're I just think, saying that because the blurb is on the cover of your book. No, I'm not. I'm saying the last season was quite good. I was really... I, I think that he, he... I think it was the best season yet. Huh. The season before, I hated I hated it when he was, like, doing the producers. I thought that was stupid and self-conscious, and he seemed to be smirking his way through it. This last one, I thought, huge laughs. It was great. Huh. Well, it's changed. That's why you do more than one season. Maybe it helps if you break up with your wife. Let's not go there. No, well... I don't know about the I don't know the story behind the story, but it really it made for a really funny show. <laughs> um, so back to the strike. Back um, to the strike. Uh, so if if, if 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 your pay package has very little to do with the union, why why the strike? It's because all the people who don't have a big pay package. Yeah, but and that's fair. I just feel like if 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 we're a union and we're setting minimums and we're setting the minimums for people, look, I mean. The more residuals matter to you, I mean, the, the bigger that residual package is for you, the more you got paid to begin with, right? Right. So we're really talking about people who, I mean, to help people who have a, a smaller, have had a smaller flow, right, career flow, but pe- or a shorter pe- one. People who never get anything bought don't have any residuals, right? It's not like they join the union and automatically they get $30,000 no, no, a year. No, you got to have a project in, in some kind of, you know, downstream, whatever they call it, downstream exploitation. Uh, which is a fantastic phrase, by the way. I want to use it more. Downstream exploitation. But so, so they're fighting over the future downstream exploitation of the internet. Why isn't ex- that exactly what the writers should be focusing on? They should be focusing they, on they it. They missed the DVD boom, and yeah. now they're about to miss the internet. Boom. That's exactly my point. My point is they missed the DVD boom, and they're mad about it. So now, in anger, they're trying to make a deal where they're treating the web as just another ancillary market. Right, it's just one more thing. It's like goes along with DVDs and uh, cassettes and reruns, and it's really not. Um, my suggestion to them, which of course they don't like, is I'm a nice Republican, but I'm a you know I'm not on the I'm not on the not with the program as you put it. My suggestion is let's come up with an upfront number that's big that they can pay you to to run it for a year, and then after a year they come up with one more upfront number to pay you. And that lasts maybe three years, and they, you know, they pay you bigger checks, fewer checks, less often. But it kind of like we don't have to then know how many times this thing was run in New Zealand, or how many times it was sold to, uh, you know, uh, the Southeast Asian market. I mean, these things are irrelevant. But if they get that, if they get their number wrong, then then they're screwed. Then they've got. They're screwed business. until the, until five years from now, when we we can go out on strike for one number, get that number up. But see that way. No, no. But if the studios put the number too high, then you know nobody knows what this market's going to be. If the studios put the number too high, then in five years there are no more studios because they've all gone broke. Um, they're paying writers for things that they're not generating any revenue from. Not necessarily. No, no. I mean, then obviously the number won't be outlandishly high. It'll be some, something based on what you can reasonably expect in a year. But I don't. I'm, I see. Put this. I don't want to know. I don't care how they show my work, whether they show it on broadcast or pay cable or free cable or reruns or off-network reruns or on streaming on the web. It doesn't make makes no difference See, to me. I, I think as a writer, it shouldn't make any difference to us. What do we care? Yeah, are I just we, want to get paid for it. Are we only talking about what happens to, you know, TV shows, you make a, you, you, you show a show on TV and then it gets, goes into syndication or it goes on the web? Yeah. It, and are you saying that that whole model will dissolve, that it won't be first shown on TV. It'll first be shown. Of course. On, uh, and so, yes. And, and are you saying the writers are are geared to maintaining that model, but it's going to dissolve, and then they're going to be screwed? I'm saying it's General Motors, 1973, and General Motors is wrong, and the UAW is wrong. Right? No one. No, there, there was no brain trust in 1973 at General Motors who said, "Well, this is going to. We're going to be. We're in trouble. Everybody's going to be buying Toyotas." They just thought, okay, we'll deal with the UAW, and the UAW was asking for a lot, and they said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll you know, haggle and find some number. And meanwhile, the Japanese are opening up uh, plants everywhere, and everybody's buying a Datsun or whatever it was back then. Actually, and, but you could argue that since GM is still around and the UAW is still around, and it's just whittled down gradually, 
But that was actually a smart move for the existing members. I mean, they're all retired now. Everybody who's around in 1973 has had a nice life and, and, and worked at the, not a nice life, but a, 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 a you know, a, a normal working life, you, making union pay, and they've all retired now with full health benefits. So they did, the union did right by them. They just, they did wrong by American industry. Whose side are you on, man? Uh, I, I, no, I'm just saying that. Uh, you know, you could, you could make that case. Uh, I, I don't know. I think that the unemployment in the Rust Belt started to rise around 1974, right? So Every, everything went all the hell in America in 1974. Uh, or or did, it, did it all coalesce? No, but that, if you look deal. at all the charts, 1974 was the, the the Ford administration was when all the economic indicators went south. Went south, yeah. Well, I, I would just say that, um, uh, that, that that is not a uh, that is not a model to march around a studio with in the rain. <laughs> Uh, by the way, I heard a great um, a great uh, 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 repost by some, you know, uh, craft union. I think it was a, a first AD or second AD, not craft, but like a IATSE guy. Uh, as the writers were picketing outside, he opened up his office window and shouted, um, "I'll march with you when you stop writing exterior night rain." Uh, which is a very inside thing. Like when when the writers stop writing scenes that take place at night in the rain. Uh, we'll get the the, the crews and the uh, and the teamsters will be more more uh, behind us, which is a good point. And, and that's because they don't like to work at night in the rain. Yeah, but isn't the rain fake rain? No, it's still wet. It's fake. It's, it doesn't matter whether it comes from a cloud or a gigantic, you know, round shower head. So they it's weren't they weren't objecting that it was like bad cliche. No, no, they're we'll checking that at night, at night, you shoot at night, and everybody gets there at 7 o'clock at night, and they work until 4 in the morning. And then, you know what happens? Then the producer, who is also a member of the Writers Guild usually, comes up to the, whoever the uh, UPM, the UPM does this, comes up to the various... Uh, cra- uh, What's uh, a UPM? Production, UPM, Unit Production Manager. Okay. The guy who, like, basically keeps track of who's working and how long they're working right. on, on the crew. And at the, you know, at uh, 4 in the morning, he comes up to you and says, uh, now, are you going to be a jerk about the turnaround time? Meaning, are you going to insist on 12 hours turnaround, which is what the union says? I mean, the dirty little secret here for all the writers, I mean, I hate doing this because I, I clearly at, at Hollywood parties I'm talked about as a, a, you know, as a, you know, the skunk of the garden party. Um, but the dirty secret is that there's not a writer in town of, who's really ever done any real work on a set who hasn't complained about the union rules that the Teamsters and the IATSE people live by. He yeah. hasn't said, oh, God, they have to have their dinner break now. And now we're marching around like we're sort of, uh, you know, wobblies together. Well, you, so you, you, you shoot until 4 in the morning, and, and you're mad because they, they, they don't want to come back at 9 in 5 no, they're hours? Not, right. No, they have a 12-hour turnaround. <laughs> no, you, so, like, you have to organize these like a puzzle piece. It's perfectly fair, but I don't think there's any really – and there's no – I've never met a working writer, I mean, who is a writer-producer who's produced things too, um, who has not complained about that. Well um, – yeah. No, I had some. I had some thought, but I've I've it's, I've lost it. So we're all gonna. We're all the shows are gonna take place in the daytime now. Yeah. Well, probably not. No. It's gonna be like um, like you know, Route the, sixty six. The uh, yeah, around the, the clock. I just think that. Well, I just think that the interunion brotherhood between the writers and the produ- uh, writers and the uh, teamsters and the writers and IATSE. Um, I believe it will be. It will last about uh, the good feelings will last about twenty four hours after the, the the strike is over. What What do you think is going to happen? Um, you know, what was destined to happen, probably. Uh, I think the directors are going to get a great deal. They're going to go probably go in um, next uh, next week, maybe, a week from now. They're not um, on strike yet, right? No, they'll st- their, their contract is up in June, but they'll start, they'll start working on a deal early. Right. They'll get a good deal probably in January. SAG will cave, and the writers will be punished. SAG is, are the actors? The actors. But they're not on strike either. No, but their, their contract is up in June. So they'll probably start early. Uh, negotiating early, right around the time that the, D- the DGA gets a deal. Well, so you think the strike is going to go until June? This is the writer strike. Yeah. Good. Did you think? Really? I he- I heard an interesting theory. Uh, at the same party where you- where your name was taken in vain. Uh, what is what was this party? Oh, it was a, a business party for California Magazine. California Magazine is, is that California business? Magazine? California Magazine doesn't exist. Los Angeles Magazine. Oh, that party. That party. I was invited to that. Well, see, so you didn't show up. I didn't go. Who were you, who were you talking to? Uh, I forget. I, th- this, I think this thought came from Kim Masters. He forgets. Oh, Kim Masters. Uh, who, but I, no, see, now, I can't, now I can't say the thought, but never mind. Later I will I'll come up with another thought later. That What was the thought? Well, you want my thought? Well, 
I'll, 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 I'll let me put another thought first. Okay. The, it's the uh, the the union's going to win because the the opposition the studios have hired Chris Lehane. <laughs> well, yeah, I think that's possible. Uh, <laughs> that's that that made me feel the, very good. The man who's it. presided over virtually yeah. every Democratic defeat and it's pioneered the the art of overspinning. Uh, you know, fighting back. You got to fight back instantly with all you got, and yeah. uh, and that and, and it usually results in disaster. You can talk to Governor Gray Davis about that. Sure, Governor Gray Davis would know about it. I, and I President think, Gore. Yeah, President Gore. I would actually hire, uh, I hope they hire Bob Schramm. Then we have like a exacta, you know, we have a perfect thing. But, you know, we could have Peter Chernin and Les Moonves going around saying they hear the voices of the little guy. I, yeah, I don't see how Schramm, Schramm calls this the people versus the powerful, I guess. I don't know. It, it would be hard for it would be hard to impose cookie cutter Schrammian populism on this on this hard but, or impossible impossible but um, I don't think impossible uh, actually you know I mean Hillary Clinton got into trouble with Lehanism with overspinning because you know they they fought back against Obama claiming that Hillary was ambitious <laughs> by saying right. by right. saying oh your kindergarten essay. And, like, you know, because they did it instantly and they had a whole team geared to rapid right. response, nobody thought, hey, this would make us look like idiots. Right, exactly. And, and that's exactly what Lehane specialized in, is, 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 they, like an idiot. is winning the news cycle but losing the war. Exactly right. Well, uh, the, the, the idea that the news cycle here or PR here is relevant in any way is kind of ludicrous. I mean, uh, I would have loved to have been in the – I would have loved to have seen the PowerPoint that Chris Lehane presented to the <laughs> AMPTP because it must have been – I mean, these, these, I mean, the writers guild are the same way. They're sort of thrilled by like, oh, the poll numbers show that the American people support us. Like, what? Well, this is a, this is a business dispute based up with a, based on a, a small piece of the contract that is itself a small, small piece of the working writer, the working writer's life. So. Yeah, it's, it's not going to be resolved on the basis of public opinion. No, and I, when I sort of opted out of the hard stuff, of the of all of it was when uh, early on, like the first second day of the strike. They sent an urgent email for us all to go to a march for justice. They oh, called it a march I, I for justice. I would think you would respond to that, Rob. March uh, for justice? We're, uh, we're talking about money. It's money. <laughs> uh, there's nothing wrong with money. Money's perfectly legitimate. I mean, I'm a Republican. I love money. I, I, I put it this way. I'm a Republican. I only love money. But um, well, the idea that we're calling this a march for justice and we have to listen to Jesse Jackson and John Edwards talk about justice is yeah, just not my yeah. thing. Yeah, well, that's, that could be like a... A, 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 a studio ploy to grind you into submission by making you listen to Jesse Jackson. Um, yeah, that could be. The, uh, the uh, we found out about Chris Lehane from the website of uh, Nikki Fink. Sure. Uh, who's become uh, all the writers I know just read her blog incessantly. Yeah, refresh, 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 yeah, refresh. Lo- right. You're looking for any clue as to what's happening. And and, and what about this thought? That the you know she obviously has some sources on the other side in the studios mm-hmm. that they're jerking around the writers like a yo-yo by promising that oh a deal's imminent and then no the deal crashes and they're basically you, leaking stuff to Nikki Vick and and practicing psychological torture <laughs> by by lifting your spirits and then you're deflating basically them. waterboarding us. They're, if it, uh, something like that. Yeah, I don't. Uh, it could be. I mean, I, I look. I go to her site twice a day. I you know I try to go in the morning and then later on after dinner. But um, I, it, it could be. Look, uh, th- that's the problem with this dispute: is that there are uh, the, the the economic requirements of all the members are not unionized. I mean, we not we, we are not unified as an economic group. We're not like uh, teamsters who are driving trucks or uh, auto workers who work in a factory. We are, we're all at different levels at different points, um, and I suspect that. That's what the un- that's what the that's the leverage the studios have. They can hold it. They can hold out. They can hold out until June. Hmm. And, and why wouldn't they? In a way, it's like um, I mean, here, here's my dark scenario. Yeah. Uh, after like today or tomorrow, it's been six weeks. So they can force majeure anybody they have a contract with out. You know, my contract at Disney suspended, but I expect that they'll send me a letter tomorrow, or the next day, and say, by the way, since you haven't worked for six weeks, we are. Now, force majeuring your contract, it's over. You're basically fired. The contract's canceled. The strike they, counts as force majeure? Yeah. All right. And they can, can, they can do that all over town. Right. And they can do it to people who are working on shows that are in production, right? I mean, I have a pilot I'm doing at, at ABC, but it you know, hasn't been done yet, so they can stop me anytime they want. 
And then the strike goes on, and people get panicked, and finally, you know, the writers make a bad deal, which is inevitable. And um, they come back to me, and they say, oh, yeah, remember that pilot that you wrote for ABC? We still kind of want you to do that. But, you know, we're not going to pay you what we were, we're going to pay you in the old contract. We're going to pay you 30% less. So you're saying they make up for whatever they give the writers by screwing you, Rob Long? Yeah, look. And the, people like you. The goal, exactly. The goal of the studio is to reduce overhead, right? They want to reduce the amount of money they are on the hook for, for in, in the case of failure. And this is a great business to fail in. I mean, they pay you a lot of money to fail here. 98% failure rate for television, 98% failure rate for features, right? I mean, right. this is a good business to be in if you're a writer because you get to write and write and write and write, and they make a TV show that gets canceled, or they make a pilot that doesn't get bought, or they pay you for a script they never produce. I mean, this is a good business to be in. So... The, what they what they want to do is they want to squeeze down all of the not the guild minimums but the episode fees and the the inflated uh, script fees they pay you which is set by your agent and your lawyer it has nothing to do with the guild so so if they can get that number down that'd be great so this is Sherm again I mean this is redistribution they they're going to increase the minimum for for the bad writers and 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 screw people like you. Well, see, I'm in, I mean, take from I, the rich and give to the poor. That, here's that, where I get you know here's where I get sort of big government Huckabee. I mean, I, I'm in favor. If this is a union, let's treat it like a union. Let's let's organize a, a a set of minimums and payments to protect the writer who isn't successful, who doesn't have a deal, who doesn't have a show on the air, who's not working on the staff of a show, who doesn't have a feature film or two feature films in his budget. People who don't have um, haven't had a level of success that's really going to compensate them for whatever happens down the line. Let's make it for that for that little guy, right? So, so that you could actually be a writer who sells one script and then works for ten years on another script. But I don't quite understand. I mean, you come. You, you, I, I grew up in Kansas. I come to Hollywood and I decide I want to be a writer. I have no talent, and you're saying the union will guarantee me a, an income for life? No, it doesn't guarantee you anything. You have to sell something to be a member of the union. They don't let you in. You got to make money. You have to have a. You have, you have to have sold a project. How much you, do you have to have sold? Oh, I forget what it is, but um, you know, it's pretty low. In fact, I know writers who uh, who who, when they were eligible for guild membership, couldn't afford to join the guild because it was like twenty five hundred bucks or thirty five hundred bucks, whatever it is. And so they they weren't paid enough to even pay the union dues. Well, so so everybody gets into the union, and then and then they all qualify for this minimum, and it seems. You're not qualifying for the minimum, right? The minimum is based on uh, for minimum feature fee, minimum pilot fee. Those are rarely, rarely um, uh, used. I mean, mostly if you're going to if a if a network is going to pay you to write a pilot script, they're going to pay you a significant sum over the guild right. minimum. Okay, that's just for that's just to keep you from being exploited. Okay. But, but that's that's where the fat is in, in all these budgets. The fat are in these episode fees. And the truth is that the studios all compete with each other for talent. So they got to pay me, you know, whatever, thousands of dollars an episode. Because if they don't pay me, I can get it from Sony or I can get it from 20th or I get it from Warner Brothers, right? But huh. since all Sony, Warner Brothers, and 20th and TBS, they're all in a room together right now, they can collude right. on what they're going to pay, not the minimum, but the maximum. I mean, it's brilliant. They can actually take 30% probably off the top. Well, but then once the, but once the strike is over, they'll start competing. So they'll want your services, Rob. Yeah, but they'll have it. They'll if they can just do a break in the bubble, that would be great. Yeah. Well, so if all these writers are out of work, that maybe I can afford a better place around here. You know. Yeah. Well, We're, I should say Rob and I are neighbors, sort of. Yeah, sort of. He lives. On I the, live in a slightly more desirable part, but let's not get into it. That's true, but my neighborhood has rustic charm. Okay. Uh, um, you know what? We'll go with that. We'll say rustic charm. <laughs> Um, so let's talk about politics. I thought we were. Chris Lehane is... Uh, well, we, Chris Lehane was our transition. Okay. Uh, uh, it, wait, who pays for this blogging heads thing? Uh, I think Bob has venture capital from, from a group headed by the guy who, in, who started C-SPAN. Oh, C-SPAN. Well, they made a mint. Uh, maybe they did. Do they have sponsors? See, that's, what, that's what's going to go with television. I don't think C-SPAN has sponsors. Like, I, I would say, this, you know, hey, I'm enjoying an espresso coffee. <laughs> the, um, espresso for those blogging head TV moments when regular <laughs> coffee just won't do. Um, it's true. I mentioned to some network correspondent that I was going on blogging heads, and his response was, "Whatever." Yeah, he doesn't but, know that we're closing in on Donny Deutsch. Well, I mean, good lord! I mean, I yeah, um, we are. I've seen the numbers. We are closing in on Donny Deutsch. Really? Wow. Slowly, but um, and we're not getting paid. I'm being exploited again. You are being exploited. So, well, as, as my agent said years ago, when I told her I was writing a, a novel. 
She said, hey, look, if you want $800, I'll give you $800. <laughs> so I sort of feel like that way of blogging. I'm doing Blogging Heads TV. Look, uh, here's $20. <laughs> um, no, we're, we're, you're... you're you're going, you know, we're expanding your name, your brand, your yeah, name recognition. I know, that's right. I, um, can, I can monetize myself finally. So I, you, you can't see me, Mickey, but you know, I'm growing a beard. I'm not oh really God. growing it; I'm just simply not shaving, and it's coming in all gray, which is not good. That is scary. Maybe you should like nip that in the bud. I might have to fix that. Um, here, here's the thing on the Hillary campaign. And see, I, okay. I, I think we're at the moment. Remember you that scene in t- I t- for some reason I was thinking about the movie Titanic, where <laughs> the guy that designs the ship goes to the ball and says. In an hour and a half, this entire ship will be sitting at the bottom of the ocean. Yeah, I, that's sort of the Hillary campaign. In, you think? in in a month and a half, she's going to be sitting at the bottom of the ocean, and people sort of know it. Yeah, I think. Well, this is the CW of the moment, but I think it's right. She's terrible on the attack. You know, she has yeah, this theory. You're right, you're right. She has this theory. She's going to take out Obama, and even if Edwards wins Iowa, that's okay because she can deal with Edwards later. Yeah, and she can't deal with Obama. But her attacks on Obama have been totally ineffectual. They've only driven her further down. Well, so the then great, what does she yeah. do? The, 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 the irony is that she's in this terrible box, um, and it's actually kind of it, it, it's like a perfect storm of of, uh, of vulnerabilities and, 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 and flaws. I mean, Obama is going to get a lot of attention. If he just keeps saying, Bush, Clinton, Bush, Clinton, bad for America. Turn the page. Turn the page. Right. I mean, he could be new. I mean, when was the last Democrat who won on the I'm experienced ticket? Right. Well, but the war, you know, if, 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 if Iraq is a mess, you sort of want somebody who knows what they're doing, no? Do you? Or do you just want a... Look, Obama can... He, I don't even know what his... Obama can say anything he wants at this point. He's a fresh face. Turn the page. Americans, I think, want a, want a new cast, right? They're well, going to fire the old cast. They want a brand new cast. And what will be more brand new than Obama? And right. I know a lot of people who, like, they just want to vote for the guy, right? They, I mean, I know a lot of Republicans who say, you know what? It might be good for the country. No, he has a lot of crossover appeal. And I guess the important thing is that he, 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 he he's, I'm just thinking of this thought now, which may be bogus, that he gives the impression of constancy and stability, in other words, and, and that sort of the fact that he re- retains his equanimity in the face of Hillary's attacks right. shows that he's not going to go off the handle. He's not a flake. He's cool. He's going to appoint the, you know the same people that Hillary would appoint probably, and he's cool. You know, it, it, everything will be sort of stable. If I continuity, if, yeah. If I were Naomi Naomi Wolfing him, you know, his campaign, yeah. You know, instead of Earth tones, I'd say every now and then, you know, smoke that cigarette. It's a cool thing to do. It's to see the queen, you know. I'll tell you something. Let me, you know, you can't see me now, but I'm doing pretty pretty good pantomime here. I'd say, um, let me tell you something, Senator Clinton. I don't buy it. It's fantastic. People not love it. Yeah, the French would love it, but I don't know about Americans. You think you because say, look, I, I smoke two a day, two cigarettes a day. It relaxes me. Because it's not PC or because it's cool? Because it's cool. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. The, um... Uh, cool. I think cool will win for him. I mean, I think he could be president. Um, I'm now thinking that more and more. Bizarrely, Hillary's attacks have increased his stature. Look, the more he the, the more he says, "See, it's time for a new cast. See, we're going to turn the page." Don't, don't, don't you think Hillary's in a bind because she's a woman too? I mean, that, this is sort of the standard standard uh, argument, but I think it's true that it's very hard for a woman to be nasty. Harder than for a man. <laughs> you, you believe that Hillary Clinton finds it difficult to be nasty? No, no, it's, but it's hard to come off as forceful and appealing when you're being nasty as a woman. People think you're shrill and bitchy. Um, the problem with her is it seems all in, ser- all in service of just getting the job. I don't know what she wants to do. So do you, she really hasn't connected very well to... Do you know what Obama wants to, to do? Say, yeah, well, Obama doesn't have to. Because what Obama wants to do is the subtext of his campaign is we're going to like the black guy. A black guy that we can all like, that like, we're not afraid of. And, and it's, that's the subtext of that campaign. And part of that is that the world will like me, so I'll calm down the world? Uh, yeah, part, look, I think, I think, I mean, I think what Obama has going for him, I mean, I, you know, I'm a Republican, so I'm, I, it terrifies me. But I think what he has going for him is he can say, you know, you can vote, we can all vote for this guy. He's not going to be that far left. I mean, were I Obama, I'd be moving more to the center when I get the nomination. Well, you can easily do that. You can easily do that. Uh, he's not. He's he's going to be this fresh face we haven't seen before. He's going to make me feel good about this country and about the unity we need. Um, I think that you could have a moment where people say, you know, I want to actually elect somebody that I like, 
that I that I'm 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 I'm, I'm going to see. You know, Americans are what they when they elect a president, they're just casting a guy to be on their TV for four years. Right. Is he going to wear well? I mean, this guy's going to be with with me for four years. And I think they're going to like Obama. They're going to like the way what it says about us as a country. They're going to like what it says about them as the person pulling the lever for Obama. They're going to like it. And as long as he doesn't scare people, I think he can witness. It's weird. I always thought that uh, Obama. I liked Obama because he had the potential to be a black Gary Hart. Uh, <laughs> but it turns out he's the black Jimmy Carter. I mean, Rich Lowry wrote that in National yeah. Review, and, and that does seem to be right. He's not a guy who really wants to bust Democrats. You know, yeah. sort of uh, mistaken. Uh, you know, knee-jerk assumptions. He's a moralist, uh, and he has a, sticks his chin up, and and he's he's um, yeah. he's sort of moralistic the way Carter is. But so is Huckabee. But so, you know what? Here's the difference between Obama, I think, and Carter. That Obama, when he gets in, I have no doubt it's not it, 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 that his Secretary of Treasury is going to be a Bob Rubin figure. Right, right, right. You know, I I, I, I get the establishment. Carter's choices were all established. And name, I mean, he had he only had establishment in Washington. I think that Obama's going to be more. Actually, have a, probably a better, you know, the uh, better sort of Clintonian kind of business picks, which I think are going to make people feel good. Right. But my, my point is that Huckabee is also a Jimmy Carter figure. I mean, he's 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 not that conservative. He sort of believes yeah. in a lot of big government. His his whole basis is a moralistic appeal. So we're going to have Jimmy Carter versus Jimmy Carter. Finally, uh, and you know how, you know how many houses are going to be built for the poor. Um, I, I, I no, I don't think Huckabee's going to get it. Why not? Uh, they haven't even begun to tear him apart for spending so much money. He's going to, I mean, he's a big government Republican. Right. I can't wait to, you know, New Hampshire is going to be, you know, WMUR TV 9. It's going to be saturated with attack ads on, what do we really know about Governor Bill, uh, Huckabee of Arkansas? Uh, he's an Arkansas Republican. What do we but really did, know about him? But didn't, he was endorsed by Grover Norquist, or he was semi-endorsed. He was, they, he, Grover, okay. Grover said nice things about him. Okay. I don't know. It, it just seems to be he reminds me of Jimmy Carter, and at this stage in the in the campaign in '76, everybody said, "Oh, Carter, he's going to be ripped apart in New Hampshire," and then he wasn't. Uh, he's, well, but I think he wasn't. But that doesn't mean that um, thirty years later, that Mitt Romney uh, and Giuliani, who have a lot of money, aren't going to rip him apart. Yeah. Did you? Um, That's what I would do, right? Did you see Romney's speech, big speech, or did you hear it? Did you read it? I didn't. I didn't read it or hear it. I'm, I'm going to sit down and read it soon. I'm, I'm, I'm eager, eager to find out what he has to say about Mormonism. Well, he doesn't go into Mormonism. That's the, oh, really? That's the essential contradiction of, of the speech, is he says... That's all we want to know. I want to know about the underwear. Yeah, I know. He doesn't go into the underwear. He, he says, he wants credit for all the things that you like. So he wants credit for believing in Jesus Christ and believing in God. But if you want to go any further, it's a test of tolerance. It's against the American way to ask me any more. It's mighty convenient that he happens to draw the line exactly yeah. where yeah. Uh, his beliefs begin to depart from the majority of the, voters. The, the the New Testament, um, the New New Testament. I mean to say, yeah. And uh, it's a it's a uh, well. I mean, I, I think he'd be better off simply not addressing it. I don't know why he's addressing it at all. It wasn't that bad. It had. It had it, I mean, it's he. It's a contra, It's contradictory, but he might be able to pull it off. His speech had a very good closing anecdote. Okay. It had two John Adams anecdotes, which seems. Like too, too many. But the second one was good, and um, plays well in New Hampshire. Well, and uh, or maybe one was John Quincy Adams. I think they were both John Adams. And um, the he had this horrible paragraph though, where he, where he which I was so awful, I had to blog about it before we went on. Which is he has this condescending sort of petting zoo paragraph where he says, "Now I admire many things about many other religions. I admire the Jews for their ancient heritage, and the Lutherans for their independence, and the Muslims for praying so often." You know, and it's like, and what do you say about the dumb kid in the class? You know, he's punctual. And the, uh, and the, uh, he's so yeah. clean. Right, and and the, yeah, and the Zoroastrians for their wonderful, um, you know, wedding uh, uh, feasts. Right, and their yeah. food. Yeah, <laughs> the Chinese for their food. And the Chinese for their their <laughs> their, their their reverence for uh, their elders. Yeah, it was it it was just it was absurd. It was like good for him. It was like he was trying to boost the self-esteem of all the kids on his football team. You know? <laughs> That's right. We're all bro- well. Look, I don't. I don't know why he did it. I don't know. I mean, I'm not looking at the numbers. Maybe he needed to. But um, it seemed to me that the best thing for him to do is say, "Oh, come on, it's just another Christian sect. Relax." You know, the more he, the more he. Yeah. And I, I say this as someone who embraces all faiths and creeds, and I, I love all people, irrespective of their religion. Um, it's weird that one. And so the, the less we talk about it, probably the better. I mean, because 
when when a when a religion has a specific kind of underwear, I, that's the thing you want to kind of bleep over. Oh, I yeah, sort of like the idea of the underwear. That's one mm-hmm. of the more appealing aspects of the Mormonism, I think. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's like it's supposed to be uncomfortable, right? I don't know. I think that's the I'm idea. I'm not wearing any. <laughs> Rob, um, I uh, I do. I, I had people a Mormon, are watching. You can't. I mean, I'm wearing underwear. I'm just not wearing Mormon. Underwear. Oh, okay, oh, good. Um, I, that's I did a have a Mormon assistant uh, once, um, and uh, and about the seventh or eighth day in, we said, "Hey, um, are you wearing that Mormon underwear?" And his voice is. I knew you guys were going to ask me about the underwear at some point. It's hey. supposed to remind you of your covenants, he said. And did, um, was he wearing it? Uh, we, I never got into it, but, but I love the <laughs> phrase, it's supposed to remind you of your covenants, which really means it's supposed to be really complicated to take off. So you really have to want it off. You know? It can't oh, is that just, the idea? Okay. Yeah, it doesn't just fall off. You have to make a choice. There's a lot of buttons and etc. So you have a lot of opportunities to like have second thoughts and say, you know what, maybe we shouldn't do this. I well, that seems wife, that whatever. that also seems very functional. So I'm pro. I, it's you're pro Mormon underwear. I'm pro Mormon underwear. Good for you. Well, that's the, you're, you're maintaining your uh, your sterling reputation as an iconoclast. <laughs> I'm um I'm trying to think if I have anything more to say about about this. Um, it's good for Romney that people are talking about it now, and he's an appealing figure. So it seems to me. I don't know. Maybe so, maybe so. I don't know. I, I I'm not sure of that. I'm not, I'm not convinced of that. I'm not convinced that what he needs to do is to is to. I think what he needs to do, what both these guys need, both Giuliani and Romney need to do, is to is to neutralize Huckabee. Or actually, I don't think Giuliani needs to do that. I think that Romney needs to do that. So rather than talking about his religion, I would be talking about why that guy is dangerous. I would be driving Huckabee's negative self. But this is Iowa. If you do that in Iowa, you lose. Really? Because they're nice people there, Rob. They are? You know that. You've driven across the country. I, I Well, they're nice people everywhere. Yeah. That's the, that's the cliche, and I think it's sort of true. Well, but you know, there's nice and there's there's nice and there's true. You could just say he spends a lot of money. Flinchy, That's true. hard, you know, you know, farmer stock. We don't we don't cotton to big government. That's a good point. Yeah, he's not corrupt. He's just misguided. Yeah. Negative campaigning gets a, just a terrible re- has a terrible reputation, but it's hugely effective. What is a terrible reputation? Negative campaigning. Oh yeah, no, I agree with that. The um. That's why I mean, it's the only thing I could say. Fred Thompson, he's obviously incapable of positive campaigning. But he's yeah. great. On, he's great on the attack. He's, yeah, he's good on the attack. Uh, I think John Dickerson and Slate finally wrote that piece. The question for Huckabee is going to be: Do you really think you're going to win? And when you're when it's clear you're probably not, um, who are you pissing off? Because Huckabee is a fantastic veep choice, right? I guess that's right. And if you're Giuliani or you're Romney, you know it'd be nice to have uh, nice to have a, a former evangelical minister on your ticket, right? Right. I, although, got a Romney Huckabee ticket. That's pretty religious. Pretty heavy on the religiosity. Yeah. Just, just think of the underwear. <laughs> um, the um, well, I think we're through with the campaign. Thank God. No, uh, no. I mean, they're still going on. We're, we're done talking about it. Uh, yes. Um, and I wanted to raise the issue that always comes up when one talks with a conservative Hollywood screenwriter or actor <laughs> or producer. Both of those times. Um, no, I, there are three or four of them. Yeah, I, I, in the old days, I, I had a joke. I used to say that uh, the good news is that one out of every three Hollywood Republicans goes on to become president of the United States. You can't say that now. There are a lot of us. Um, well, but maybe you'll, I guess you won't like that many presidents. You can right. all fit into somebody's living room, though, can't you? No. No, that person will have to would have to hire a tent. I thought you've been in that living room. It's Gary Sinise's living room, and you were all there. I've never been in Gary Sinise's living room. But there was some party that Gary Sinise gave for all the right wingers in town. And they weren't all. Some were. Out, some of us were out of town at the time. And it, and it wasn't. But it didn't like. They didn't have to call in the police for crowd control. It all fit in somebody's house. Well, Whereas if you had, some, it all probably fits in somebody's large backyard. Yeah. If you put all the liberals in town in the sports arena, it would collapse. Hmm. I mean, good idea. <laughs> it's um. Uh, there's just no comparison. But anyway, I think there is discrimination against right wingers in Hollywood. Really? Yeah, well, it's based on two experiences. Okay. One is I ran into a conservative director, and I said I called him a right winger, and he sort of said, "Shh," you know, and he needs to raise financing for his movies. Mm-hmm. He didn't want it known that he was a right winger because that would kill his chances of getting liberal money. Really? Uh, and he's a very good director, so um, I, I, I thought that was that was credible. This was about ten years ago, so maybe it's changed. And the second thing is I I, I was having this argument with a friend of mine. He said, "Oh yeah." 
I know somebody, a writer who was about to be hired for a TV show to sit in the room and do whatever you writers guys do, and then they found out he was a Republican and they and they canceled it. Wow. Uh, those are my two pieces of evidence. You think that's not true? Uh, I don't know. I mean, that that uh, I don't know. I, I I only know my experience, which has been I've been a Republican for ever. I mean, it's like the Red Sox is the team. You know, um, half the time I hate them. Right, so half the time they're I, I don't. So, uh, I came. I came. I put it this way. I, I moved here in 1988. I graduated from, uh, from college in '87. Uh, so I started here in '88. I, I got my first job in 1990. Right. At age of 24. So should we pause while you do the math? I'm 42. Uh, I found actually Hollywood to be more open. I mean, I was working on a show called the Cheers, right? Right. Which is filled with incredibly active. Left wing Democrats from right. the top of the show, from the from the management of the show, from my first boss, all the way to the cast, and um, they never once, I don't think, held it against me. And I worked there all the way. I was one of the executive producers at the end of it. Did so, they did they hit up the other people for campaign contributions? Yeah, isn't that a crime? Uh, yeah, I, I was a, I, I, I didn't even know I wasn't supposed to say okay. I said, forget it. I'm not going to give Barbara Boxer any money. I'm a Hershenson man. Um, <laughs> or whatever it was. Uh, I think it was Hershenson. Oh, was it Hershenson Boxer? I don't know. That was probably too late. Well, that's sort of funny in itself, but... Um... Yeah, that's right, right. Um, uh, but I never felt... I mean, I look, I, I actually feel, maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like there's more freedom of thought and expression in Hollywood than there was when I was in college. I think a, a, a major U- U.S. university is a more closed-minded and I think... Uh, uh, you know, speech coded place than we, Hollywood. Did you find did you feel so really stifled in college? I find that hard to believe. Oh uh, well, you know, I mean, I, I wasn't that I wasn't that right wing in college. You know, I, I cast my first vote in 1984. I was whatever I was then. I, I voted for Jesse Jackson in the Connecticut Connecticut State primary. So, so why did you become right wing? Because uh, I was told all through high school and college that Ronald Reagan was a crazy man who was going to blow up the universe with his crazy nuclear bombs and that, that the Soviets were our friends. And really, it was just a matter of uh, misunderstanding. And um, when that didn't happen, right, all these dire predictions from the left didn't happen, you start saying, wait a minute, if that's not true, what else isn't true? And then you, so, you see things like, well, okay, so someone writes a good book on welfare reform, that makes sense. And then you talk to some people about school choice, and that seems to make sense. Um, and so pretty soon you just kind of gravitate, for me, just gravitated to the right. I'm not that far right. I mean, I always say this about Hillary Clinton. You know, I am to the left of Hillary Clinton on some social issues. I'm in favor of gay marriage. I'm against the death penalty. Um, pick another one, you know. And those are pretty big. Are you, wh- 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 how, where are you on choice and abortion? I'm pro-choice. Huh. But I'm also pro-school choice. Which I think is a slightly more important issue. It is, but um, and I would vote for I will vote for a Democrat who's in favor, of, who's really robustly in favor of school choice. I guess I guess you aren't much of a conservative then. The people that the National Review should really watch they should it. they should fire me. No, they know this. Like I'm a wet Republican. I'm exactly the worst kind of Republican. I'm, I'm like I'm a New England Republican. I'm the first one they kick out of the party. When it, you know, what do you feel? How do you feel about national health insurance? Oh, I just I just uh, it terrifies me. <laughs> Why does it terrify you? seems like a very expensive thing. It seems like it's going to be, it's going to be bring of us all the benefits of, uh, of the national health insurance in Britain and uh, none of the fun. And also I think it's just going to lead to more, more and more divisions where uh, middle class people uh, are forced to, you know, it's going to be, it's going to create a school system, the public school system where only the very rich get to go to private schools. No, Only the very rich will get good health care. The rest of us have to just, uh, you know, stand in line. Hmm. Well, the goal is that everybody stands in line, but they get good health care, and then the rich get super good health care. But yeah, well, the goal is that everybody gets a great a free education, and the rich can go to, you know. I mean, I I, 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 I judge by Medicare, which is a which is you know the most left the most left wing health care position is me, is Medicare for all for everyone. So let's look at what Medicare does now for old people. My father had cancer. He went to. What, what was him, what was, uh, you know, by his research, and everybody said one of the best oncology centers in, in you know, in, in the city. Uh, and he was sitting next, he was a judge, and he was sitting next to plumbers and, you know, custodians and poor people, and they were all getting the same care, and it was all good care. So uh, it seems to me that's a success. It's not that 
My father got lousy care because he was in the yeah, system but, with but everybody else. A, he got very good care because he was in the system. Could you have gotten that? Isn't it possible that you get that kind of good care because it's, you know, let's be honest, it's freshness dated. A lot of people who would qualify don't live that long. And the people who are, who do qualify are already old. I mean, you know, no offense, but you, you've taken a group of people who go to the doctor a lot probably, but there's only so much we can do. And you said, okay, at the very, at the very end of your life, you're sort of covered. I mean, the hard part is not covering people at the end of their life. It's covering them from the day they're born. I think the expensive part is the end of the life. It, the expensive part has become the end of the life. But it's inherited the end of the life because you're fighting a losing battle. And you're you resorting to more and more technological okay. tricks yeah. to win that losing battle. Right, but, you know, that, 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 that is going to be adjusted downward, isn't it? I mean, you'll probably get a break on it if you sign one of those advanced health care directives. What do you mean get a break on it? You'll probably get a break on your insurance. I mean, they'll come up with some way to say, okay, look. That is what I'm worried about, and I'm especially worried that Hillary is going to do that. Yes, well, it's, that's I mean, her it's the only way to do it, isn't it? Well, no, it depends. I, I, it, 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 it's only the way to do it if, if you have cost-cutting as one of your overriding goals. But isn't that and the it, overriding goal? Right? Isn't that the goal? Well, people praise Hillary's plan because she sort of downplayed cost-cutting. Well, and it seems to me I that any time – the reason I like government health insurance is because I think the politics – will militate against cost-cutting. When you try to make people sign advanced directives, there's going to be such a stink that the government will be less effective at making people do that than, in, than I think the private looking, sector. I think you're looking at, I think the health care uh, the, 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 the bureaucracy that's created by national health insurance will resemble L.A. Unified School District, which is simply not responsive to anybody's demands or questions or accounting or anybody's consumer pressure at all. But that's I, think not true a, with, I think it's a it's like a fantasy that that it, it will be. But that's not true with Medicare. So why should it be true with national health insurance? Nobody's nobody's more sensitive. To, you know. Well, anyway, that, mm, I don't know. I mean, I think people just won't stand for it. You, if they try to, I mean, if they try to kick mothers out of the hospital after a day, Hillary Clinton sponsors a bill saying, "No, we guarantee them two days," and then they're guaranteed two days. So the results will be not cost cutting, but it'll be. Uh, the over-provision of services, which is fine with me. Anyway. Uh, not me, though, because I'm a Republican. Okay, well, you really are a Republican, then. You know, are there new, are there new workhouses? That's my point. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, maybe they shouldn't fire you at National Review. <laughs> well, that's, you, that's what they keep saying. It's like uh, I, have, I have the cold, hard heart of a Republican. But, uh, you, but on a few issues, I, you know, I don't know. You, huh. The, um... I'm surprised that you're anti-death penalty. I am. I think... Uh, you see, you're for, you're for killing babies and saving murderers. Yeah. I mean, you're for your, your no, pro-abortion. Uh, uh, I'm not for it. I just... Uh, I, no, the death penalty, I feel like two reasons. One, I don't think it's a deterrent. Um, because the people who are on death row weren't thinking. And the second thing is, I just don't like giving the government or society that, that kind of power. That will only lead to trouble. It's a, I think it's, to me it's a small price to pay to keep someone in prison for the rest of their lives. That's uh, some some uh, right winger famously said it's like uh, it's uh, you know like having the the U.S. Post Office have the job of deciding to kill people. That's that's and, how we that's that's how Republicans always you know that's our I, I, he used the U.S. Post Office I use L.A. Unified. But for the death penalty too? Yeah, all metaphors, all government metaphors. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. Well, I think um, I don't know if LA Unified has a national appeal. I say go national, Rob. All politics is local, man. Uh, you're probably right, but then I'm not. A, you know, I'm a I'm a I'm a local. And you defend the French. I love the French. I I, I especially now. My God, no, I love the French. I think the French have a have a place, have a place in the nas- in the international conversation. I don't like. Uh, I love France. I think it's great. This is like Romney's petting zoo. I, lo- I love the French for their food. Their food is good. Yeah, no, no, no. The food, that's an important thing. Um, I also think, I, unfortunately, I think with France right now, they've got to figure out a way to, like, uh, to, and I think Sarkozy might do it, to, to implement certain reforms to keep what they've got and to be a little bit more competitive. The problem is that's sort of a slippery slope. I mean, if you go to Paris, Paris always looks gorgeous, but that's because it sucks in all these resources from the rest of the country. Um, and, uh, you know, trouble trouble can be brewed that way. It's not a stable society, France. It isn't? No. I mean, my God. They've, how many revolutions and uh, new governments and collapses of old governments have they had in 200 years? Lots. Hmm. When, we, when we were uh, 
we, you know, we were trying to decide between, um, you know, you know, Gilded Age presidents. They were, they still had an emperor. Well, so how would it be unstable this time? Not you're not talking about the, the Muslims in the Bon News. You're talking about something else. Yeah, I'm talking about like what happens when people from the uh, outside of Paris suddenly realize what a strange elite there is in Paris. That the, the elite, if you go to two or three schools, you have a sort of a guaranteed job. What happens when they sort of want access to sort of capital and they start like being capitalists in Toulouse and Lyon and all the other places? They're going to start feeling like maybe they should pay less in taxes that go directly to Paris to keep the streets beautiful. Hmm. I mean, you go to Paris right now. Paris is like a dream. I mean, if the, if the, if the dollar wasn't so weak, it'd be a fantastic r- retirement place for Americans because everything's subsidized. Uh-huh. Uh, and the, 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 the town is gorgeous. It's huh. just that it sucks resources from the rest of the country. You would just think that if they, if they, if they wanted to revolt against the domination of uh, people who've gone to the right schools, they would have done it a while ago. Well, you know, give them time. Yeah. It's like the Chinese. Well, plus plus now it's moved up to a higher level. The people that go to the right schools are in Brussels, dictating to all of Europe. Right. So a revolution in France won't really do them any good. You know, I don't know. I mean, uh, it, it, it just uh, I think that we Americans always think of Europe as the stable place where they have traditions. The traditions usually in Europe are revolution and sort of mass murder. Not <laughs> really, you know, we're the, we're the old guys. We're the old guard here. Huh. We seem positively hidebound. You know, we haven't changed our system of government in, what, how many hundreds of years? Uh, this is a dark note you're ending us on. Oh, we have to end on a dark note? That's crazy. No. Let's find something. What, there's something good is happening. Let's talk about something good. Um, I can't think of anything. They're, they're building a Whole Foods down the street. And do you think that's good? No, it's going to destroy the neighborhood. You think? Yes. It will destroy the neighborhood, or it will confirm I, the neighborhood has been destroyed already. Well, both. I should say we live in Venice, California, which is a, right. which, uh, unlike virtually every other community I've I've lived in, sort of pleasantly mixes very rich and very poor people. Yes. Uh, not totally, obviously, but not totally pleasantly. Not totally pleasantly, but pretty pleasantly. But we have, you know, it's it's. And it's not just racial. They're they're sort of poor people of all ilks here, and crazy people, Don't and crazy people, crazy people, and, and and but it's become such a desirable place to live that right. pretty much the, the streets are now filled with BMWs and Audis. It's a it's a it's a place of derelicts and posers, which is not a bad thing. I, I, I don't know. I, mean, I think I'm both. <laughs> well, you're definitely one. Um, anyway, it, the, the, those places are rare and fragile, and and it's about to be destroyed. I think. Well, look, it's just a matter of time. I mean, the, the, the Venice is, is inside L.A. It's the last part of L.A. that hasn't been, you know, overcome by enormous sums of money in, in real estate investment. So what are you going to do? I mean, uh, either you want to live here or you don't. If you want to have a house, you have to move, you know, how many, two hours away. I mean, that's why, I mean, just to get back to the, the politics of movie making and TV making, just, just to wrap it all up, because I know I'm blocking against TV, it's important to have a summing up. Uh, you notice that on going to any movie set or TV set, the the actors and the directors, they tend to be very left wing Democrats, and the crew tend to be a lot more conservative. Uh, and I was talking to a studio head about that. We were sort of laughing. He goes, "Yeah, well, you know why those crew guys are so right wing? Because they have to, you know, they, they they listen to all that talk radio for hours and hours and hours every day." I mean, because they live in because Fillmore. they live in Apple Valley, they're driving for three hours, and so they're listening to you know Raj and Hannity and all those guys, and so <laughs> like, well, because they can't afford to live in L.A. because you guys just spent seventeen million dollars on a house in Brentwood. Oh, but that may be why Rush and Hannity are so popular because they their natural audience is people who are so pissed off at having to drive all the way from the suburbs, or yeah. they're just in the car anyway, driving in the suburbs. I mean, they're not listening to uh, you know NPR. I am. I know you. And I listen to you on NPR, Rob. Thank you. But so what we need is a huge crippling strike that, like, makes all these rich people in West L.A. less rich. And we're having it. Hey. All right. It's Bob Trump's fantasy fulfilled. It's completely, it's happening and it's happening before, it's unfolding slowly before our eyes. And we can do, and we're powerless to stop it. It's the best kind of change. Uh, you're, I'm not, I'm powerless to stop it, but you aren't. No, not, what you, can I do? You could lead a march across the picket line. I don't lead marches across anything. And I won't cross the picket line. I won't scab, I won't cross the picket line. This is the team I, I'm on, for better or for worse. I'm just going to sit in the corner and think my dark thoughts, but that's about it. 
I'm sure. I'm sure the, the the leadership will be hardened by this display of solidarity. No, I think they already. I think I'm already <laughs> in the crosshairs. The next time I appear here, it'll be having been fined and I'm sure tarred and feathered by the by the the, uh, the brain trust over at the WGA. That'll be great. Yeah. Okay. Well. So now this is my first blogging heads TV. How did I do? Did I do okay? I think you did fine. I don't. I didn't see what you did. So. I wasn't doing it. Maybe talking. there was like a lot of great physical comedy going on. No, it's just that, my normal expressive self. Oh, uh, that'll do. But did I? Did I? You know, did, is this? Is, is this? Was it deep enough? Was it not deep enough? I think we'll let others decide that. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to upset the venture capitalists behind the big C-SPAN success. No, I'm like I'm like Mitt Romney, Rob. You know, I, I admire your punctuality. <laughs> and, you know? and the and the tightness of the underwear. <laughs> exactly. You, sh- you showed up on time, and you're clean, and that's all we really ask. Okay, that's I can I can do that. <laughs> um, Except for the on time and the clean part, I'm, I'm I'm signed up. Okay. Well, this was fun. Let's do uh, it again. Yeah, but just before I go, I just want to remind you: um, don't send the check to my office. Send it to my PO box here because I don't go to the office. Um, okay. No, but it'll it'll come. We're there. You know. Right. Eventually. This isn't free, is it? Uh, I'll let you talk about that with Bob. Yeah. What kind of business model is that? I'm not striking to be be free. The answer is it's the Ariana Huffington business model. Oh, that's a good one. And I told told her your line, actually. Oh, really? Which is that when you're driving down Sunset and you figure if you turn north, if you turn south, you don't have to be paid. But if you turn north to go to her house... Yeah, when I went to her house for a party, just to bring it back, I, I realized as I crossed Sunset to go north of Sunset, I thought, hey, I'm not writing for that Huffington Post unless they pay me. South but, of Sunset, you know, north of Sunset, you got to give me at least 50 bucks. Because she lives in such a rich area, you expect yes. to be paid. Right. But her, her response was, but south of Sunset is richer. And she's actually right. Um, not on her end. On her street it is. No way. <laughs> no way. Well, I think this is an issue... F- no yep. way. I think on as you as you move farther down Sunset, this is of course a very interesting to people who don't live here. <laughs> Although, but, but what they should know is that mostly what people who do live here do is try to figure out how the various fine ways to cut the neighborhood. I live here, but not there, and a little bit like that. And it's kind of the the new part of something. It's it, it's important. Uh, uh, Rick Caruso lives south of Sunset, man. Eh? Rich people live south of Sunset, uh, but he lives around Bristol, right? In, yeah. in Brentwood Park. Yeah. Okay, well, Brentwood Park is not south of Sunset where she lives. That's not Brentwood Park. It's like two blocks away. You really are cutting it fine. Two blocks is two blocks. <laughs> okay. Two blocks one way, you're in South Korea. Two okay. blocks one way, you're in North Korea. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. Anyway, I hate to break it to you, but you're not getting paid. I knew. I, I Something told me I wasn't getting paid. Uh, but, uh, you're, you know, maybe I'll talk Bob into buying you dinner or something. No, it's, don't worry about it. Okay. I'm just, I'm, just, I'm, not, I'm just another writer being exploited. Well, there you go. Um, well, uh, this is fun, Mickey. Okay, it's great. I'll see you in the neighborhood. See you, see you around. Yeah, yeah. at Abba Kitty. Right. Cool. Yeah.